Are you tired of working so hard just to get fit? Are you tired of bogus diets that simply don't work? Oh, I've tried everything to get fit besides consistent diet and exercise. Hi, I'm Dr. Leanne Martin, founder and inventor of a brand new revolutionary fitness product that is sure to change your life. Maybe you're like one of the millions of Americans who, although making New Year's resolutions to get healthy and fit, have found yourself once again, like year after year, overwhelmed and discouraged on your fitness journey. Have you ever wondered why being healthy has to be so difficult? Shouldn't you be able to lie around all day, eating as much as you want and whatever you want, while still looking like a supermodel? We don't think that's an unreasonable thing to ask. That's why we've engineered a brand new revolutionary product. It's a one-of-a-kind surrogate subliminal workout DVD that requires absolutely no effort whatsoever on your part. Introducing Biomedical Ocular Liptoprotein Obesity Gnawing Nuclear Advancement Program, or Bologna for short. With Bologna, we work out hard so you don't have to. Simply pop in our subliminal surrogate workout program and watch as our fitness instructors sweat away your calories. Basically, you get fit while you sit. Just imagine you eat Cracker Jacks while we do the jumping jacks. And don't worry, the calories that you consume during our Bologna program are immediately canceled out by the hard work done by our fitness instructors on your behalf. Don't believe it works? Just check out our 100% genuine, 100% unaltered or undoctored before and after photos. Overseen and endorsed by over 30 almost certified medical professionals, tested by countless others, nearly FDA approved and guaranteed to produce results that last until you notice otherwise. Just imagine vicariously receiving all the muscle tone and definition you've always wanted simply by watching a DVD. This is our promise. Our promise. Why do backbreaking sit ups when you can sit up and do nothing? Why do crunches when you can crunch on some Cheetos? Why do push up jacks when that guy on the video obviously does them so much better than you anyway? Get shredded by eating shredded cheese. Get fit by fitting as many chips into your mouth as you possibly can. Get lean by leaning over onto a chair. Get abs by doing absolutely nothing. It's your couch. You can sit on it if you want to. It's finally time to have your cake and eat it too. At Bologna, we work out hard so you don't have to. Just hit play. Just keep hitting play. Bologna does the rest. Oh, come on, come on. How many of you wish that was true in here, that you could just push play and, 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 and start losing weight and getting fit and those types of results. That's my type of workout plan, but I mean, you know, it doesn't work that way. And, and so this morning, we're going to talk about that a, a, a little bit, and, and uh, we're going to wrap up this series. You know, over the past five weeks, we, we've heard messages of, about things that you can do in your life and things that you can apply in your life and, and the way that it can, uh, you know, see the benefits and fruit in your life. But uh, now it comes down to time. You've heard it. Now it's time that we do it. And so this morning we're going to talk about being hearers of the word and not doers. So come on, let's pray and just ask God to speak to us. Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. 
Lord, we thank, thank you that it's powerful. God, we just thank you that for your messages and things that you have given us over the past five weeks. God, we just pray, Father, that, that we will uh, be hearers of your word, and, and uh, not just hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word as well. God, we just pray, God, that we would do that so that we can see the fruit that you desire in our life. God, we pray you speak to us this morning. And God, uh, may your word penetrate our hearts and change our lives. And we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, I, I think a lot of people, you know, it, it's funny to, to watch a video like that. And, and, of course, you look at it and you can see how silly that that looks to, to think that you can just sit back and watch other uh, people exercise and think that you're going to get in shape. But I, I think the sad thing about it is, is that a lot of Christians live their life that way. They sit back and they consume a lot of messages. They consume a lot of word. They, they, they uh, take in a, a lot of things. You know, they even write notes. They, they may memorize some of those things. But then when it comes time to actually do something with it, we kind of miss that, that role. And, and so it's no different than the person who is sitting on the couch doing nothing, expecting to become uh, somebody who is uh, in great physical shape and stuff. It's just not going to happen. And listen, over the past few weeks and, and stuff, I've been giving you messages about what God wants to do in your life and, 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 and not allowing the enemy to still kill and destroy uh, you know, in your life in certain areas. But now it comes time to where we've got to begin to exercise our faith by some obedience. It's time that we start to work out our salvation. It, it's time that we, we put feet to our faith and begin to do this. And, you know, Wednesday night I started, uh, kind, I set, kind of uh, set up this sermon with, with the message that I gave Wednesday night. We were talking about the power of God's word and, and listening to God's word and, and, and the benefits of, of, of hearing God's word and how he wants to speak to us and stuff. But when he speaks to us, he wants it not just to go in one ear and out the other. Not just to be written down in a journal somewhere and nothing done with it, but he wants us to put it into practice. You know, God's word in, in, in several places, it's referred to as like a sword. In Hebrews chapter 4, 12, it says the word of the Lord is living, it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing as far as the divisions of soul and spirit of, of both joint and marrow and, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart. And in Ephesians chapter 6, 17, Paul is talking about the armor of God. God, and he talks about how you've got to put on the armor of God. But in verse 17, it said, take up the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And see, here's the thing is, is a sword was meant for battle. A sword was not meant to be left in a sheath and, or to be hung on a wall as decoration or anything. A sword was meant to begin to battle the enemy and, and to, to be able to fight. And many Christians don't reach their full potential because they never pull their sword out of the sheath. They never begin to apply it. They never begin to even fight the enemy with the word of God. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, every time the enemy came with a temptation, what did Jesus fight with? He fought with the word of God. Every single time. And he was able to defeat the enemy. And we've got a lot of Christians that are walking around weak and puny when they have everything that they need to be able to defeat their enemy. They're just not putting it into play because they're not, they're not, they're just hearing the word. They're, they're not doing what it says to do. You know, uh, me and Melody were watching a show one night and it, it was this lady that lived in, in New York and, and she was an accountant and made, you know, six figure income, you know, so had the potential of being uh, very well off. She, she made money and everything. But uh, the, the whole documentary thing about her was she would never spend any of the money that she earned. I mean, she would dumpster dive and, and find all of her clothes. She literally, like her clothes were too big, so she just put chip clips to kind of hold them tight to be able to wear it. And, and they're all sagging and, and just dirty and stained and everything because all of her clothes she had found in dumpsters. And, and she was having some friends over for dinner. And, and, and so she goes out into these nice restaurants and goes back to the trash can hands and begins to, you know, pull out all this food, this half-eaten scraps and leftovers that had been dumped out, and she begins to collect all of that, and then she goes home and puts it all together in a pot, and she warms it all up, and that's what she began to serve uh, the guests that came over, and so here's this woman who 
had the potential to live a very comfortable life as far as financially and everything, but she wasn't accessing the, the, the power of her resources that she had been given by her work. And it's the same thing as Christians. We have the ability to live a much better lifestyle than what a lot of us do because we are not accessing the full power of the Word of God in our life. And one of the biggest areas where we miss it is because we don't put into obedience the things that we learn. You know, at the verse at the end of that thing that she showed, James chapter 1 Verse 22 says this, it says, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. And and, and once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what kind of person that he is. You see, why do we go and look at ourselves in mirrors? We go to look at ourselves in mirrors so that we can begin to see if there's, any, you know, hair out of place, if we got anything on our face, if we got any pimples that are just kind of bulging and we need to kind of squeeze that thing and, and release the volcano of, of, of pus from behind there. You know, we, we, we begin to, we're, we're looking to fix imperfections in our life. And that's what he said is the word of God is like a mirror that you can hold up and you begin, you can look at it and you can see the areas where, where you can do do a little bit of work where you can fix this up a, a little bit and, and stuff. But I think a lot of Christians are kind of like me with mirrors. You know, when I, when I go to a, I, I very rarely ever look in a mirror. And, and, you know, I get up in the morning and I, I take a shower and stuff. And I get up and I just kind of do this. And that, that's kind of, I go. And if I pass by a mirror, I may kind of check real quick and go on. You, you know, but, but I, I don't do that. And I think that's what a lot of people do with God's word. Is they begin, they kind of look at it. But then they put it down and, and they just kind of go walking on. And James really is, is kind of insulting people who are uh, not doers of God's word. Because he said, they said it's like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. I don't look at myself in a mirror very much. But if somebody asked me, how would you describe yourself? I wouldn't say, well, you know, I'm about six foot five. Uh, I'm kind of dark complected. Okay. You know, uh, very handsome. Rugged good looks, you know, that, that type of thing. I, I'm really kind of swole and, you know, built and all that stuff because I work out so much or I watch a video on TV or something. But, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't describe myself like that. I know what I look like. I know I'm not tall, dark, and handsome like I just described. I know I'm short, pale, and this. I, I, I'm aware of what I have here. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of who I am because I have seen myself enough. And see, here's the thing. Many people, they've heard the word and it shows them the things that they need. But they're just not willing to fix it. And some people, when they hear something that kind of steps on their toes a little bit, they want to go and, and go somewhere else because it, it gets a little uncomfortable when you're confronted with the truth of, uh, of the word of God. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to begin to deal with it. But, but it's no different than that friend. How many of you have that close friend that, that is, is close enough to say, hey, look, you got something in your teeth. You need to you know, go dig that out before you go somewhere. Or, or even more, you got something kind of hanging right there. Yeah. You got a little friend. Melody would tell me, there's many times, I'm getting ready to walk into a meeting, and Melody would be like, hey, you got a friend. And I know exactly what that means. That means I need to go uh, clear out a little bit of space there so that I'm not grossing everybody out by, by just allowing something to hang. That's gross. And see, here's the thing, though. Christians who see themselves in the mirror of God's word and don't make the adjustments They're grossing out the world. We have the most amazing God, the greatest love, the the, the greatest love story and everything like that. We have the the most powerful Lord. We have the the potential of, 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 of living a lifestyle that is far above what we are living. But people look at our lives and they see the same mess and dysfunction in our lives that they see in them. And they look at God and say, well, they ain't no different than I am. They're just, they're just as bad of a worker as I am. Their, their marriage is just struggling as bad as, I'm, as mine is. And we say one thing with our mouth, but then what's hanging out our nose is saying something completely different. 
And see, you don't get mad. I don't get mad at Melody when she tells me, hey, you got, you got a little friend. You got you to fix something there. And we shouldn't get mad when the word of God steps on our toes and confronts us. Because we got to realize that that's spoken out of love. Because it's given the hope, you know, it, it, it's, it's the potential. God doesn't want us to be embarrassed by the area in our life anymore. He wants us to be able to walk free from, from that and free from that fear and everything. And so we've got to begin to, to implement the things that, that God speaks to us. But here's the problem. For many of us, our knowledge far outweighs our obedience to God's word. I, I mean, if, if you really think about it, you could sit there and, and just take a couple minutes and you know there are areas of your life that God has, has spoken to you that you need to change. There's relationships that, that he's pointed out. There's, there's, there's ways that you treat your spouse that he's pointed out. There's ways that you handle your finances. There, there's ways that you talk to your kids. There's, there's things like that over the course of time that God has pointed out that you have left and you, you're continuing to walk. And that's like Melody saying, hey, you got something hanging out? You know, and I just continue to go on and show that to everybody else. It, it's foolish. And we've got to realize something that the lives that we live and, and the, the things that we do are going to uh, represent God. Many of us cry out and ask God for wisdom. But then when he gives us the wisdom, we don't apply it because it's not easy. It's not, or it's not what we want to hear. And we're hoping that somebody else would give us a plan B that's a whole lot easier than what they just told me. And it's time that as men and women of God, that when we are confronted with an issue in our life, we make up our mind that we're going to do what God's word says about it and not look for somebody who is going to water it down enough for us to, to make it easier for us to take. But we want to represent God well. You see, our prayer shouldn't be for greater revelation. Our prayer really should be for a greater level of application. You got many people who are like, God, I want you to show me more in Scripture. I want you to teach me more. God, reveal yourself to me in a greater way. And God's like, what are you doing with what I've already revealed to you? Can I tell you something? God is a God who distributes things based on stewardship. What are you doing with it? We talked about this with gifts. We've talked about this with finances and everything. But this morning, I want to show you that it's not just gifts and finances, but even with revelation of God's word, he will only give you what you can handle and what you will put into application. And so there's many people who are crying out for God to reveal himself in a greater way. And God is saying, just obey what I gave you first, and then I can reveal you other things. You can't handle the other things yet. Even Jesus, when he he was teaching his disciples he told him he said look I can't you can't handle the things there's more things that I want to teach you but you're not able to handle them yet but when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you he will teach these other things to you and God graciously doesn't deal with every issue in our life all at once or we would be completely overwhelmed but he reveals things to us in stages so that we can begin to, to work out that salvation and, 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 and see those things. Listen, God's word, it, it says that if you are faithful and little, then you will be a, he'll make you a ruler over much. And it's the same thing with God's word. If you are faithful to obey and to apply and stuff with God's word into your life, then he will give you more. And if you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 13. And I'm going to show you this in, in Scripture about the, the benefits and, and things that, that there are many of us who have a hunger for God's Word and we desire to have more of God in our life. But, but God is waiting on us to, to begin to obey a little bit more. And so Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, he teaches a parable. And then he wraps up the parable like this. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 9, he says as He who has ears, let him hear. And I said this before, look, it ain't like Jesus is preaching to a bunch of people who don't have any ears on the side of their head. And so he who has ears, let him hear. And those of you who don't have ears, line up over here. We're going to have a prayer line after service, and I'm going to come and, and pray over you so that you can have ears. Look, every person probably that he was speaking to had ears to be able to hear. And so he's not saying he who has physical ears, let him hear. In fact, if you go and look it up, the phrase has ears means he who possesses understanding and, and the word here means consider what is being said. And so Jesus, after he teaches a parable and begins, he says, look, those of you who have the understanding, 
I want you to consider what's being said. And every time that we hear the word of God or we read the word of God. It would be wise not to just hear the word of God. But to begin to consider what it says and how it applies in our life. Every time that you leave a church service, you should be asking yourself, what was God trying to speak to me? And what am I going to do with it? Because if we want, if if we're going to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, look, how many people you have, you uh, have had great intentions that you were going to exercise or you were going to go on a diet and you were going to lose weight and you were going to be a better parent or you were going to be whatever and, and you've had great intentions uh, to be able to do it, but then you find yourself six months down the road and you still haven't even started to, to apply that thing in your life. Why? Because you didn't make a plan of how you were going to do it and you didn't begin to walk it out. Listen, when God begins to speak a word to your heart about some change that needs to happen in your life, you need to pray about it, you need to consider it, and then you need to figure out how am I going to get from point A to point B and begin to put this in application and begin to walk this out. You know, at the beginning of the year, I I set a bunch of goals for my life and, 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 you know, things that I wanted to do, scripture memory, you know, uh, amount of leaders I want to raise up in the church, you know, things like that. And and so I have those as goals that I want to do in 2015. But everything that I do, I'm like, okay, I can't just say, God, I want to raise up this many people and God, I want to read through the scripture this many times. I have to get a plan that is going to be allow me to be able to, to do the things that I asked to do and one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to read through the Bible three times in one year which I have never even been able to come close to being able to do that so you know what I had to do I had to find Bible reading plans that would permit me to be able to do that and so I I find plans that you can finish it in a hundred days I find plans and then I have to be able to get on track and start walking it out because I want to get from point A to point B to meet the goal or the thing that I feel like God is asking me to do. And it's no different in our lives. If, we, if God is beginning to reveal something, an area of weakness or an area that we need to change, we need to consider what it is, pray about how we get from point A to point B, and then begin to walk in it. He goes on, Matthew chapter uh, 13, verse 10, it says, His disciples came to him and asked him, Why do you use parables when you talk to, to the people? And he replied, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. That kind of seems unfair. In in the world today, everybody thinks everybody should have full access and equal access. Everybody get the same trophy. Nobody loses, all that stuff. I mean, that's the, the type of world that we live in today. Let's make it all fair. And that's the biggest complaint that, that people have is it's not fair for this person. It's not fair for that. I mean, you'll have people that on birthday parties and stuff, they got to buy a gift for every other kid that shows up, uh, you know, because it's not fair to them that they don't get a present. Melody's mom was horrible about that. Every time it was one of our kids' birthday, she would want to go buy all the other kids' birthday presents. And I told her, I said, Miss Billy, stop that. She's like, but it's not fair to them. I said, it's not their birthday. Their birthday will be here in six months. And then it would be unfair to the other ones. It all balances out. It's all good. Don't worry about it. You don't have to buy, buy all them things. And listen, it's the same way with God. There are things that he will teach some people that he will not teach other people. I'll show you another place in Scripture, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. I'm sorry, Psalms 25, verse 14. It says this. It says, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make a covenant, and and he will make them know his covenant. David said, there's secrets that God tells some people. The people who fear the Lord, and here's the thing. If you fear the Lord and you have a fear of the Lord, then you're going to obey what he says. You're not just going to be a hearer of the word, but you're going to be a doer of the word because you want to make sure that you're pleasing before God and and the fear of the Lord drives you into obedience and stuff. And so what he's saying here is there are secrets that God is going to speak to some people and covenants and things that he's going to reveal to some people that he doesn't to other people. But it's based on what they do with what they already know. And their, their, their respect and their honor for God's word that it's not just some book that's, oh, that's good information. But it's something that they're going to take and they're going to learn and they're going to begin to apply in their life. Some people are like, well, I'm not so sure I believe that. Well, let me show it a little bit farther. 
Genesis chapter 18, verse 7. Let me kind of set the, the, the thing here. Uh, uh, God is, is getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he's getting ready to wipe it out because of all the great sin and everything that's there. But, but Abraham has a nephew named Lot that is living down in the city. And, and so God uh, says this. It says, uh, the Lord said, shall, we hide, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And that word Lord is the Lord Jehovah. It's God. And so God says, is it right for us, me to hide from Abraham? I mean, he's got a nephew there named Lot. So should I hide from Abraham? And then he goes and he begins to speak to Abraham. And he tells him of the destruction that's getting ready to come to Sodom and Gomorrah and everything. But here's the thing. Lot, he didn't speak to. And some people were like, well, Lot lived in an evil city, and so he was probably just evil, and he just wasn't close to God, and he wasn't saved, and that's why, that's all, all that stuff. But if you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, it says that Lot was a righteous man. So here is Lot that God's word in the New Testament describes as a righteous man, and he lives in a city that's about to be destroyed, but God isn't telling him about it, but he tells his uncle about it because of the relationship and stuff here. Can I ask you a question? How many of you, you just share every secret you have with everybody you know? Why don't you share your secrets with everybody that you know? Because you don't want all that stuff blabbed to everybody. There are some things, and, and, you, know, you know, that you don't want everybody to know because you can't trust what they would be able to do with it. And see, that's the same thing with God, is God is a God of stewardship. And every area of our life, he tries to see what are we going to do with what he gives us. Can we trust it? Can he trust us with more? And if he can trust us with more, then he'll give us more. It's the same thing with, 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 with finances. Can he trust us in the little, and then he'll bring blessing in. In the word of God, it's the same thing. Can he trust us in little? And if he can, then he'll bring more. That's why I said that re- we need to not pray for greater revelation. We need to pray for, pray for better obedience in our life. Because the way to get a greater revelation is by obeying what you already know. And there's many people who are searching, 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 searching for knowledge. But knowledge, if it's just in your head, isn't going to do anything. It's only applicable when it's in your heart. See, knowledge in your head is the sword in the sheath. It doesn't do anything. It just looks pretty. may make you look smart in front of some people, but it's not going to bring change in your life. It's not going to defeat the enemy, and it's not going to help you to walk in, into a greater lifestyle. And then we'll go back to Matthew chapter 13, because Jesus says this very next thing. He said, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given to them, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little that they, they understand, it will be taken away from them. There's some people, as I was going through that, God has secret things. You're like, I'm not so sure, not so sure, not so sure. What did Jesus just say? He said, if you want greater knowledge in the word of God and greater revelation in the word of God, do something with what you already have if you want to know God in a greater way and you want God to reveal himself make sure you are obeying and lining up your life with the in the areas that he has already taught you over the past five weeks we've hit five areas in our life you know over the course of 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 sermons and stuff we talk about different areas and stuff and now it's time to to decide what are we doing with it look we can't just sit around getting fat and consuming a a bunch of the word of God and getting fat and doing nothing with it it's time that we begin to go out and work out the the, our salvation and begin to to take the steps that he's asked us to do and and begin to use the the weapons that he's equipped us with and, and things to begin to build his kingdom because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's kind of like somebody, they can work out for a while, but then they stop working out for a while, and then what they used to be able to do when they worked out all the time, they can't do it anymore. And that's the sad thing, is a lot of Christians really on fire for God. Three to six weeks. Then three to six weeks, I'm off, I'm tired done with this and then they come back and expect to be able to do everything look I can tell you this I couldn't get up here and preach week in and week out if I wasn't staying connected to the source day in and day out 
I would have nothing to offer. And it's the same thing with you. Your life is a living epistle read by all men. And if you are not staying connected to the source and being obedient to what he is telling you, then what the story that you're writing out that people are reading are not the story that represents God. It doesn't represent his power. We'll give you just a couple things real quick that, that, you, that basically what to wrap this up as far as what we, we must do. The first thing is we've got to hear his word. We've got to begin to take understanding of it. We've got to begin to read it. We've got to begin to, to dig into it. And it, this is why it's so important, listen, for you to take notes and stuff is because the enemy wants to come and try to steal the word immediately. You remember the parable of the sower? And, and it had four different grounds. It said that, that when he sowed the ground and, and it fell on the stony ground, that immediately the birds of the air came to try to steal that. And I've asked you this before, and I, and I said, how many of you, you've heard a message, and it kind of challenged you and stuff, and then you get to the dinner table, and somebody asks you, what did your pastor preach about? Um, I know he, he, he was talking about Jesus some. And it came out of the Bible. I remember that. He, he looked down and read the Bible. There was, a, there was a thing on the, oh, man, what was that he said? Listen, part of being a doer of the word is hearing it and then writing it down so that you can do the second step because the second step is considering it. You go back and you think about it. Over and over in the scripture, you will see where God says to meditate upon the word day and night. You know, in Joshua chapter 1, when he's telling, and Joshua's afraid and he's got fear in his life and all this stuff, he tells him, he's like, go and meditate upon the word day and night. Why? Because he wanted him to consider the power of God in his life. He wanted, to, he wanted him to consider the promises of God in his life so that he wouldn't have the fear to be able to step out into what God has called him to do. Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 says that, that blessed is the man who sits in the, uh, the not in the seat of the, the ungodly or, or sits in the council of the ungodly, but that he is planted in, in the, uh, the house of God and that he uh, meditates upon the word day and night. Why? Because God wants us, he knows that if we sit in there and consider in it, then we're going to act on it. And here's the problem, many of us, the things that we consider the most actually just feed our fears instead of feeding our faith. We consider a lot of things and think about a lot of things. But most of the time, the things that we allow to stay in our, in our thoughts are worry, fear, confusion, doubt. When if we take what God speaks and we write that out or we highlight that or whatever, we can go and when those thoughts of worry, fear, doubt, confusion start coming our way, temptation, whatever it may be, we can take what God says about it and we can turn our focus onto God's word and how to apply God's word instead of sitting there and allowing ourselves to, to fall into, uh, you know, the fear and being crippled. And then the last thing is, after you've heard it and you consider it, you've got to obey it. It's time to walk. It's time to get up and do what it says. Time to quit sitting on the couch expecting better results and expecting to get muscles and, and all of that stuff when you haven't done anything. You can know all about the best exercise program and the best diets and everything, but until you implement it, you are not going to gain weight. You are not going to gain muscle mass. You are not, there, there's nothing going to take place. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. You can know everything it says about your marriage, but until you start treating your spouse the way that it says to, nothing's going to change. You can know everything it says about your finances, but until you, until you start walking in it, you, nothing is going to change. Because God is waiting for you to begin to obey his word. You see, the power of God, the word of God has the power to heal marriages. It has the power to, to heal our finances, to, to bring us into the abundant life that we've been talking about. Uh, you know, but the majority of us, uh, the problem is, is that, that we either feel, feel that it doesn't apply, so we feel unworthy about things, or we have laziness or disobedience in our life, or we're just, we're just complacent with where we are. Instead of truly wanting to grow in our walk with God. And that's the thing. Listen, if we really 
want to see a better marriage, if you really want to see better financial position, if you really want to see a greater boldness in your life, if, if you really want to see these things, then you've got to begin to implement the things that you have seen and heard and, 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 and been taught in the word of God. And begin to walk it out and do it. It's not enough to have it in our heads. We've got to show it by our lives. And when we begin to confront ourselves with the mirror of God's word, and then we begin to walk with it and show it in our lives, then that's when people will see the good works of Jesus, and it will bring glory to God. Remember Wednesday night, I talked about a man who uh, had a diamond that was about the size of, a, of an egg sitting up on his mantle. And it was a, it was, he, he didn't even really know what it was. It was just this rock, and this guy came by and was like, where in the world did you get that rock? And, and, and he, he, realized, uh, he said, do you know what that is? And he told him it was a diamond and the value of it and everything. And to him, it was just a black rock that kind of had some shininess to it and, and everything. And it had been sitting on his mantle, and I mean, the size of an egg. So you can imagine how much a, a diamond the size of, a, of an egg is worth. And it had been sitting on his mantle, and, and it was a resource that was completely untapped. And that's the way that a lot of us are with the word of God. Is we, we've even written it down in a notebook. We've, we've, we've got it on our shelves and stuff, but we've left it on the mantle. And we need to get it off the mantle and we need to begin to walk in it. And do what it says. And, and begin to allow God to, to move in our lives and stuff so that we can begin to reach the full value of what it is. And see, here's the, the thing. Not only did he have that one rock that was on his mantle, but the guy asked him, he said, where did you get this from? He said, well, it's in the creek bed that runs down my house. And they go down to the, bed, to, to the creek, and it's filled with those rocks. And it was turned out that it became the world's largest diamond mine. The Kimberly Diamond Mine was in his backyard. Millions and millions of dollars. The, the royal crown jewels, all of those things, for, you know, huge diamonds came out of his backyard. And it all, had been sitting there all along. And see, that's the thing with the word of God. Is it something far more valuable than a bunch of diamonds? And for many of us, the truths and stuff are sitting there just waiting for us to mine it just waiting for us to, to read it, to pick it up, to study it, and begin to apply it into our life so that we can see the full potential. You can come on up, Brandon. But here's the thing, guys, listen. We can't ob obey God's word because we want a blessing in our life. You know, that's the whole teaching that a lot of people teach is like, Look, just obey God's word and, and do what it says, and, and then you get this blessing, and you'll get rich, and you're going to get this, and, and all that stuff. And look, those are benefits of, of, of obeying God's word. Those are benefits of, of heeding God's word, is, is that you see the better marriage, you see the, the better relationship with God, you have the boldness, you, you make the impact, and, and all of those things are, are benefits that come along. But listen, it can't be the driving force behind it. Because when it doesn't happen as fast as you think it should, then you're going to quit and you're going to walk away and say that it doesn't work. But when the motivation is simply because you love your heavenly father and you want your life to demonstrate him, you, demonstrate uh, him and his blessing and his love, and, and you want other people to see his love and his mercy and his grace through you, then it doesn't matter if things happen right away. You're going to continue to do it. I remember reading this book called High Adventures in Tibet. It was about a missionary called Victor Plymeyer. A lot of people don't even know who Victor Plymeyer is, and that's because he didn't have a world-renowned travel ministry to see millions and millions of people. He suffered hardships going through blizzards, lost his wife and kids and and things like this. I mean, just all of this stuff that there was just a hard, difficult time in his life and a, and a battle and, and everything. And, and, you know, everybody's trying to tell him, you just need to quit. You need to go home. He's running into all these obstacles, but he just kept serving, just kept being faithful and, and everything. And look, and he wasn't seeing any results at all. 
I mean, in the, in, the, in the physical, you know, it wasn't like he was seeing 100 people every week saved. It wasn't like he was seeing huge crowds of people coming or anything like that. It wasn't anything like that. In fact, it was 17 years before he saw his first convert. And in those 17 years, he lost his wife. He lost his kids to, to sickness and to disease and and all this stuff. I mean, it's just unreal the things that he went through. But he stayed the course. Because of his love for the Father. And see, here's the thing. Some people try tithing. And when they don't get win the, the, the lottery the next week, they just give up on it. Some people try to be nice to their spouse and, and treat them the right way, but, but when, it, when the marriage doesn't turn around within the next couple of weeks, that's it, I'm done, I ain't doing that no more. Some people try to, to uh, you know, cut off relationships and stuff, but the minute that they, they feel a little bit lonely because they, they didn't instantly get that whole new group of friends that they thought that they should have, then they just go back to their old life, old relationships. But see, here's the thing. Jesus in John chapter 14, I believe it's verse 15. He said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And look, this isn't like the teenage boy who says, if you love me, you will. This isn't a manipulative statement. That's not what Jesus is trying to do here. It's not what he, he's trying to teach. He's, he's, he's not saying it. He said, the natural uh, a fruit of you loving me is that you are going to honor me and represent me well by keeping my commandments. And that's the thing. If we truly love the Father, then it should be easy for us to be doers of the Word and not just follow. And, and then as we continue to do the Word, then God begins to reveal Himself to us in a greater way. And then we begin to make a bigger impact. We begin to see the more fruitful lifestyle that God has for us. There's too many Christians that are dumpster diving that God wants them to have an abundant lifestyle. And we've talked about some of the areas over the past few weeks, but now is the true test. What are you going to do with what you've heard? You need to hear it. You need to consider it. Then you need to obey it. And when you do that, you will see the fruit from it. Not only will you see it, but other people will see it. And the fruit that they see in your life, it'll bring glory to Him. And it has the potential to change their life because they see what a marriage should look like. They see what somebody who says they have faith in God and they actually, you know, they're not walking around in worry and fear and all that stuff, but they, they have peace in their heart. They have joy. They're, they're going around like, uh, Paul said in Colossians, you know, making melodies in your heart and, and all of that stuff. They, they just always have a smile on their face. And you represent God well instead of grossing him out with all the stuff that we have hanging around. Come on, let's make that commitment as a church and as individuals. I'm tired of grossing out the world with my temper tantrums. I'm tired of grossing out my world, the, the world with, with my fear and my anxiety. I'm tired of grossing out the world with the way I treat my kids, my wife, my, the way I spend my money, my worry, my fear. All, all this. I'm tired of that. I just want to serve God and do what he says because I love him. And if any benefits come, then praise God. But if I don't see the benefits right away, I'm going to keep trucking. Because this isn't about me getting rich. This isn't about me having everything that I want. This is about seeing what God can do in me so that it brings glory to him. Amen.